That's a pretty introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Aaron Tran. I'm going to give you a short talk on mobile dynamics and volcanoes. I'm going to start by reviewing some of the basic fluid mechanics necessary to understand how these systems work, and then we'll go into what I did experimentally and what we found. So I'm going to start by introducing what is a volcano. I'm sure most of you are familiar with what a volcano is, but sometimes it's nice to have a definition sort of to start with. Generally speaking, a volcano is something that allows material from depth in the Earth's crust to be released to the surface. Typically, for example, you'll see them forming these, con these conduit structures where material travels freely and builds various structures, say, for example, a cinder cone or a large volcano such as Mount Fuji. As for mud volcanoes, they're essentially similar to these, but they exist on a much smaller scale and they are less widely distributed. We studied a set of mud volcanoes near the Salton Sea in Southern California. If you can't see too well, this is the Los Angeles area, and that is our study location. It's a geothermally active area. And here's a picture of the field site. These volcanoes are about one to two meters high, and they exude mud pretty regularly, depending on rainfall, seasons, etc. And what I want to draw your attention to here is how you can see a very nice mud flow structure. And I'm going to draw your attention to this comparison of this is a reg this is regular lava from Hawaii. Notice how the flow structure on the top of this mud flow looks pretty similar to the flow structure on top of that lava flow. You kind of see these little ropes and ridges going around. And generally speaking, this is a bit of an assumption, but we do think that these mud volcanoes are reasonable analogs for lava volcanoes, which are much more dangerous and much more relevant to human society. But since these are so much smaller, they operate at lower temperatures, go below boiling point, it's a lot easier to study these guys. So now let's talk about how volcanic eruptions work a little bit. Basically, they're driven by bubbles. Bubbles come up from depth, and they move material outwards. Sometimes they explode explosively or effusively. But in the end, you're moving material to the surface by bubbles. And I'm going to focus on bubble processes going on here at the top, where bubbles are moving with respect to the medium. They're pretty big. You can get a lot of fragmenting splatter. This doesn't happen in all volcanoes, but it happens in certain ones, such as Hawaii or Stromboli in Italy. And this certainly is what's going on in our mud volcanoes. So we think it's pretty relevant. Now, in order to understand how these eruption dynamics work, uh, we can simplify the problem down to a sort of a benchmark problem in fluid mechanics of a single bubble in a large medium. So here, for example, I have a figure I've taken from a classic textbook. This is, these are the, the diagonal lines there indicate the bubble, and the lines around it indicate the flow field, where material is moving in lines of not constant velocity, lines of constant fluid, rather. Streamlines, if you take the fluid mechanics. And what I want to emphasize is that this problem has been very well studied in so-called nice fluids, which are called Newtonian fluids. Uh, I won't go into too many details, but they exhibit a linear response to stress, uh, stress or force. And the nice thing about this kind of problem is that we can characterize it in terms of only two forces, a buoyant force and a drag force. And so it makes the analysis relatively simple. And entering into these two forces, we can pick out a few parameters that control motion, namely particle size, buoyancy, which is set by mass, density difference, and fluid properties. Here we're only going to focus on viscosity, which is friction. For example, you try to push a fluid around, or you try to pour a fluid, the rate at which it moves, its speed, is set by its internal viscosity. For example, water, when you pour a cup of water here, it's going to fall out pretty quickly. But if I take honey or molasses or something, I try to pour it out, it's going to take a little while and that's set by the viscosity of the fluid. And as I mentioned before, this is a very well-studied problem. So now I'm going to try to explain a little bit of how we characterize the flow of these fluids to get a more general sense of how things work in fluids, broadly speaking, whether it's honey or water, we turn to different variables. I'm not going to explain all of them, but I'll qualitatively say, say this is called a drag coefficient. And as we increase it, we get increasing drag force. It's harder to move things. And this is called the Reynolds number. As we get a larger Reynolds number, we get messier flow, we get more turbulence. And this is what happens when we decrease the viscosity, the internal resistance to flow. So for example, as you can see here, if we increase the friction, it gets harder to move at these low Reynolds number regimes. And I'm going to focus in on this area of the curve here. Out over there is turbulence, stuff that happens in jet engines, airplanes, etc. 
things that are much more complicated. But here, the result is known from theoretical and empirical work. Uh, empirical work shown here, some experimental points you can't see too well. But we've been collecting data and this kind of stuff for the last 100 years or so. And now I notice this for bubble, or for spheres, apologies. But generally speaking, in this regime, it extends pretty well to bubbles. You just change the coefficient in front. And the scaling, the behavior is roughly the same. But the problem is, mud is non-Newtonian. It doesn't behave in this nice linear way, as I described. It has a structure because mud is made of clay minerals suspended in water. This is just an image of an, exa an example clay mineral. What I want to emphasize is that generally they have a flat structure to them. You know, they're plates, they're regularly shaped. And so we wouldn't expect them to behave in the same way. Here's a picture of an example of just uh, some clay. You can see the layering brought, around, brought about by the nature of the mineral structure. And importantly, this mineral structure reflects in the fluid properties. So we're going to add two more items onto this list of fluid properties, yield strength and shear thinning. A yield strength is what happens when you have a fluid that actually looks like a solid if you're not pushing it hard enough. For example, if you have yogurt and you kind of turn it around or batter or something, you get these peaks and ridges and stuff that don't generally flatten out in time. Let's say, for example, if you pour water, you're never going to see a regularity in the surface of water. But with a yield strength, it can persist there almost indefinitely because in that case, the gravitational force needed to drive flow is insufficient to overcome this yield strength that I speak of, and therefore it looks roughly like a solid. And for example, we can describe it as having an elastic response if we describe it, say, like a spring where you kind of push it and it bounces back, or a plastic response where you push it and it just stays there. And as for shear thinning, slightly more complicated, when you, put, when you move a fluid, it has, as I mentioned, a viscosity, it's friction, when that resists the flow. But when you have a phenomenon of shear thinning, when you try to push it, the effective viscosity decreases. So as you move it faster and faster, it gets easier to move. And I'm going to call this, I'm going to characterize this as the herschel bulkley fluid model, just for reference, which I'll abbreviate with our one acronym in here, I think, HV fluid. So where are we at in terms of current knowledge? As I mentioned, we know most everything about Newtonian fluids, spheres and bubbles have been characterized for a long time. And they've seen wide use in very, very many disciplines, geology, physics, falling spheres, carbonates, what have you. And it turns out spheres and virtual bulky fluids have been pretty well studied too. Much of it has come from empirical arguments. It's been much more difficult to formulate a theoretical argument for flow. The flow field is a little more complicated. You have material that's solid and fluid and kind of how to differentiate between the two. So, but we have something that kind of works. This Q right here is similar to a Reynolds number. We are just adding some extra terms to compensate for the more complicated fluid, but bubbles aren't so well characterized. So now let's explain our experimental procedure. We set out to try to characterize bubble motion, but first we start by using spheres to kind of get a feel for our fluid, calibrate it, and make sure the flow is what we are expecting. So here, for example, we're dropping spheres down here. We track its motion using a weight at the other end, and from that we're able to get out how fast it's moving and when it's getting to terminal velocity. For bubbles, similar idea, but we inject bubbles from the bottom using a syringe and we let them rise. But the problem is we can't attach anything to the back of a bubble. So how do we get around that? Pretty simple. Just tie it from the bottom, tie it from the top, and then using that we get a mean velocity. We're making the assumption that the mean velocity is equal to the terminal velocity, but we did test this assumption using, say, mud tubes spilled to two different heights, and we found the results to be fairly consistent. So this assumption we think is well-founded. And finally, as I mentioned, the fluid properties are a little trivial. We use a specialized device called a rheometer to measure it. I'm going to skip over these slides in the interest of time. But essentially, the idea is that we can measure this behavior and we can incorporate it into our modeling. So as for some results, if you recall that the Stokes law for spheres and the corresponding law for bubbles, we saw an inverse relation between drag and, I will say, the Reynolds number here. Q, as I mentioned, is just a generalized Reynolds number. And so this is what happens if we try extending it to the result for spheres in a herschel bulkley fluid. And again, as I mentioned. So here are some few data points we gather for spheres. We see pretty good agreement. As you recall, the curve started leveling out as you got to the higher inertia decreased viscosity. And so that's roughly what we expect around there, Q about 1 to 10 or so. Now here's the blue line, which is roughly 16 over Q or so which was what we expect for bubbles. It's pretty close, not too far, but makes sense so far. And now here are our results. As you can see, this is pretty far off. 
The red line is a best fit line to our data. And if the blue line is around 16 over Q, as from the table I mentioned earlier, this one's around 6.5 over Q. We're off by a factor of two to three, which is quite significant. And although I don't show error bars in this plot, the error bars are not enough to account for the discrepancy at this time. And just for further comparison to verify results, we use some data kindly provided by another research group. This is for a completely different fluid, but we also find much decreased drag even farther. Some discrepancy between our different data sets is explained by the shape of the bubbles and the different fluid properties. And I'm going to just explain the symbols very quickly. The colors and shapes all correspond to different experiments. So black and yellow correspond to the various, the, the other team's experiments. And cyan, magenta, and green correspond to our experiments. Three different experimental sets, but for purposes of the presentation, you can basically think of them as going all together. So a few caveats. The results we have only apply for relatively slow flow, creeping flow. And we have not accounted for a more complicated fluid behavior, such as time dependence. For example, you have a thing of mud, which is particles and water. You expect the particles to slowly settle over time. And we're not treating that at all, because we assume our experiments are done rapidly enough over the course of the day so that we don't have to worry about these kinds of effects. So broader conclusions. Uh, so how does this tie back to volcanoes? Well, as I mentioned, the drag is lower than we expect. So it's easier to move gas out from depth, which is a good thing. It may, for example, it may make it easier to move material out, may prevent material from building up underneath and exploding explosively or something. And applications, these things are sometimes important, for example, in the oil and gas industry where they use muds to lubricate drilling bits as they dig deep into the earth. And sometimes, for example, bubbles inside or whatever can interfere with their uh, processes. And for volcanic modeling, this basically only solves one aspect of things. But to actually augment it and make quantitative predictions about how volcanic systems are going to work, we're going to need some results about mass and heat transfer, which can be done, but is a separate, are two separate problems. And thanks for listening. I'd like to acknowledge a few people who helped significantly in this research. First of all, and this is the first time, my mentor, Professor Michael Manga. Uh, Max Rudolph, a grad student who helped with, with uh, a good part of his research as a mentor for the first few years. He is now a postdoc at CEO Order. Uh, Benoit, and Amita, and Benoit and Amita gave a great discussion in the lab. Jared de Bruin kindly shared the data shown uh, over here. And of course, I'd like to thank Surf and Rose House Foundation for making this all possible, especially Nathan and Leah for being awesome and making this happen. So yeah, thank you very much.